How's it going, folks? Let's see. Uh, everybody's jumped in already. Let's go to the overhead. Uh, let's see. I'm kind of jumping on the job a little early here. I know the job code's up there, but it's. For I'm just going to do the iPhone 7 first, in all honesty. We can deal with these in a little bit. Put these off to the side. Somewhere safe. Like on the floor. Just need to <coughs> increase the font size because <laughs> I'm just a little blind. Oh, I have left my glasses downstairs. Oh, that's a killer. Absolute killer. I gotta get myself another pair of those. They're not even that expensive, it's just a case of gotta get them. Alright, so we're gonna do an iPhone 7 screen squinty blind style. Hey, RSM. Uh, who else we got? Martin van Manen. Lockhart, Dursen, Albert, and Keith got a notification. Lucky you. I didn't. I just happened to be here and the stream started, so I got lucky. Hey, Ben Wilson. Oh, this is going to be fun when you don't have glasses and you got to pop these smashed up screens. It's really not a good idea unless you've got glasses. Okay, I've probably worked on this one before, I'm guessing, by the fact that this just came out real easy. Ah. No, that's not my kind of work. Oh well. You yeah, actually probably was my work. I was probably having a bad day and decided... I think I will just use a piece of captain tape to hold that annoying flex down, stop it from drifting up. Okay, Christian, thanks for saying hi. So it's better than nothing, isn't it? Yeah, well and truly cracked fan. This should be just a screen replacement all going well. I say should be because far too often you say it will only be and then it turns into some hellish disaster thereafter. Yeah, what have we got? This is the hard bit with our glasses. I am 99% sure they are Philips. no guarantee of consistency between Philips and Triwing on these phones, I've noticed. Depends on who the tech was before and whether they decide to honour the screw assemblies or not. Okay, that's been damaged in a bit there. I'm not sure if I can use an iPhone 6 assembly on that, or maybe an iPhone 5. Hey Sonia, hey Ian Rumsden. Very damp UK. Be thankful for your water, certainly. Not much fun when you run out of water. Let's see, will this work? This isn't a curved one, but uh, honestly I find the iPhone 5 corner tool more useful than the iPhone 6 one, which is curved. But you've got to be careful, because it can so easily go wrong and you end up ruining a lot of things. Yeah, I think I've pulled that out enough. That should be okay. Anyone see Lewis's phone? No, I saw his bike go up in flames, but I didn't see his phone. Oh, the phone was in the bike, was it? Poor guy. He is genuinely having a bit of a rough time there. I feel bad for him. I do hope he's doing alright. I tried to speak to him 
earlier today, but he wasn't available really. He was busy doing his other things, which is fairly normal for Lewis. I mean, come on, the guy's flat out busy just running his business and everything like that. He really doesn't have time for some small time Australian to chat to him. And I don't blame him one bit. Yeah, it seems I've got a screw missing somewhere. Well, we'll have to just live with that. So, I heard something about the fact that the pack was in parallel, or I'm not exactly sure, and it wasn't supposed to be. Certainly when... Uh, yeah, so I'm not really sure what the configuration of his pack was and what it should have been, or if there was a problem there. I know when we were doing large packs with model aircraft, you had to put quite a lot of time and effort into treating the packs properly. If you needed more milliamp hour, so in other words if you wanted to parallel the packs, what we would do is have a Y cable assembly so that you could separate the pack at the end of the day, charge it and discharge it uh, separately and so you can monitor the individual cell voltages and things like that. But when you have it in parallel, you can't really do that so easily because obviously you have two cells that are competing with each other. They certainly require different management strategies. Oh, we're just taking the iPhone touch button off. Just find a bit of heat. Seven, uh, not seven fifty. Huh? That would kill it. Two fifty, and just lifts up very nicely. It'll drop right out. There we go. Chinese sell ceramic casings for eighteen six fifty cells. They say they're explosion proof. Funny thing is, you know, the eighteen six fifty, if built properly, should be its own protection. Yeah, it's got the metal casing around it. That's the whole thing is uh, with the model aircraft type things we'd be using the soft cell lithium polymer configuration of uh, battery. And yeah, you had a very real risk there of punctures and fires and things like that. But you did it because you had a weight advantage because you didn't have the metal casing. But then there were a fair few people who started moving over to the 18650s or similar. Uh, they took the weight penalty, but they had the safety aspect. So I'm kind of surprised to hear that um, they still have issues. Okay, this definitely wasn't done by me because there's no camera guide there. They did at least leave the sensor guard on, but they don't have a camera guide. So I am not the one responsible for that. Honestly, believe one battery is short internally and trigger the entire vent. That's entirely possible too. Yeah, it's not really easy to go back from that type of event to see what happened, unless you've got some fairly impressive telemetry going on. And more likely than not, on a pack like that, you would not have such levels of telemetry. Do you know much about the Refrox software advertised? Um, I believe it's kind of like a ZXW slash EasyDraw slash OpenBoard. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's a competitor to what I produce. More focused on phones, of course. It still irritates me to this day that they have all those board views and they like share it between each other, but we can't seem to get access to them in the same way that we do MacBook boards. Um, believe me, it's extremely frustrating. I have paid out good money to people who have been able to get those board views for me, but I always need more. So if you have a way of getting the board views that we do not have, for the iPhones and well, most of the iPhones we've got now, then um, drop me a line and I can drop money in your account for being able to do that because it's to say the least it's peeing me off that in this supposed sharing community 
that we're locked out of all that data. It's some sort of like, it's like a no Paul Daniels club or something going on. People go, oh no, here comes Paul Daniels. Don't don't let him near that software. Don't let him near our data. And Nikki Danette. Ah, oh, damn it. I hate it when the this comes along with it. It's like, let's separate that, hopefully without damaging it. Twink. It's a little bit dirty there. 18650 cells have a capacity advantage over RC lipos if you can parallel enough of them to handle the peak current. They can, but yeah, you do. There is the space issue. Um, yeah, I mean, lithium. Damn it. I don't want to get a lot of liquid in there. I just want to. Okay, that's good. Certainly, the biggest selling point is their durability. You, know, you crash your plane in the ground, and your 18650s might be okay, but your uh, soft pack ones are probably, <laughs> they generally aren't. They take a bit of a fold, and you fold them back, and you lose about 10% of your capacity then, just by doing the fold and unfold. Because all the little layers of um, the roll up layers, when you fold the pack or bend the pack, they start to come in contact with each other and things like that. And that's why they can often decide to catch a light. Or at least with the 18650 and other cylindrical metal cells, you don't run into that risk so much. It also depends. You're talking um, 18650 types or lithium or lithium uh, LIFEO4s. Because the, um, yeah, the latter ones there, they, damn it, why isn't that lining up? They definitely do have a capacity advantage, but they're very fickle about being overcharged. You overcharge them once and it's like, that's it, we're out of here, goodbye. Weird, I feel like I've actually inadvertently mixed up my screws here. Not quite sure how. I can skeets. Anyone seen an increase in dead and arrival of boot looping iPad Air all generation? Mm, no, not personally, but then I don't deal with them a lot. What about the overheating of these huge batteries? Well, that's where the cylindrical cells are very handy because you have a natural air gap in there. So that helps a lot, whereas your flat pack soft cells do not tend to have air packs. We did used to have to construct some packs with deliberate air gaps in them and do forced air induction through them. But, uh, let's see, I'm not sure what Teslas are doing. I'm sure they're on, on top of that sort of thing. I believe the, even things like the Pikes Peak Tesla 3 that drove off the edge or something today, they were doing some extra cooling or something that I remember. They water cool them? Okay. Hopefully in another 10, 15 years we'll get to the point where the battery packs will be sufficiently advanced that we don't need to worry about the cooling so much. And the advances definitely do happen because when I started using flat lithium packs, the soft cell ones, we couldn't get more than about a, um, the standard discharge rate that was permitted was a 2C rate. So if you had a, 
4 amp hour pack you could discharge an 8 amp uh, rate. But these days you can get 10C no problem, 20C easy enough. There's some ludicrous claims out there but usually 10C is um, your realistic limits which means you can essentially flatten the pack in 6 minutes and it'll still be perfectly fine. So we went from barely 1 or 2 uh, C rate up to 10 and I've seen them quote 100 C but that's like instantaneous kind of thing. Hey English, yeah no problem, well thank you very much for the contribution so you know, I figured the least I can do is send you a nice re a s reply just to let you know that I did in fact get it. So yeah, give it another 15 years and the technology, the manufacturing of those packs and the internal resistances and such like that may have come down sufficiently such that they don't need to have active cooling systems anymore. At that point it will probably be a case of the wiring looms to the battery will in fact be the next target so to speak. Because even with some super fat copper cables there is um, definitely still a fair bit of resistance there. And I imagine for the actual motor drive units they're using IGBTs. I can't imagine using MOSFETs. Um, for low current levels, MOSFETs are fantastic. M when I say low current levels, I'm talking about under 100 amps kind of thing, up to about 100 amps. Once you get to pushing over 100 amps, MOSFETs, even though they can have some incredibly low um, drain source resistances even one milliohm starts becoming a little bit unbearable so that's when things like the IGBTs come into play because they do have a while they do have a fixed um, voltage drop across the junction beyond 100 amps or so it usually becomes the more favorable loss to take so it's kind of funny, we sort of started out with BJTs, um, you know, bipolar junction transistors, your usual sort of classic things that you think of when you think of transistors, you know, for amplifiers and what the, why is that look, okay. And yeah, then we jumped to MOSFETs, which really took off, as being better for power. And now we're actually back to the point where we have this hybrid of a MOSFET and the BJT, which we call the IGBT, which is Insulated Gate Based Transistor. Uh, not Based Transistor. <laughs> anyway. So it's an interesting how they've come about to that point. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with after that. Tom George, you have to replace an I $850 IGBT array in the world of tomorrow. Now how should I ask how you destroyed it? Let's see, is this going to charge? 300, okay, this is charging, so, and I can see the battery icon on there, so that's that's good, which means this can go in the trash. Pretty sure the Model 3 is using MOSFETs. They are super high temperature silicon carbide ones. It'll be interesting to see what they're doing there because the IGBT losses have certainly been superior to the MOSFET losses for quite some time. So if they're using MOSFET only, that's definitely an interesting tack they've taken. Unless they're going for the really high voltage and keeping the current under, say, 100 amps or something like that. So if you go really high voltage, under 100 amps, under 1 milliohm, obviously they just put them in a lot in parallel, then, you yeah, know, maybe it can work. But uh, maybe they're finding the IGBTs can't switch fast enough at this point for them, or I'm not sure. Hey, Warren Stamps. Has two RGBTs and an H pack with shorter base to a minute. No bang, just stop working. Well, I suppose better than a bang. 
MOSFET's other problem was always the um, drain source voltage uh, limitation. So most of the time when you look around for buying MOSFETs for your projects or picking a MOSFET for your project, you usually find the great bulk tend to be limited to about 30 volts. And once you start pushing up above 30 volts, say you go to 50 volts or whatever, you find that the uh, drain source resistance tends to take a pretty big hike, which is why you know, we just generally um, move off to the RGBTs. 1200 volts, 75 amps, yeah, that's a hell of a lot of power. It's obviously not a small, uh, small world by any chance. I had a friend, I visited a friend who's restoring model aircraft. I was playing with an emulator to fly them. So much fun. Any advice to flying them? Um, I don't know, really. I mean, I haven't flown for quite a while now since I closed the shop. Start with something that's probably going to be boring. And then your second and third model can be the one that you actually want to fly. Um, boring things like old-timer designs. I know it sounds funny, but um, old-timer designs are really good. Uh, yeah, trying to... I think the hardest thing with flying model aircraft and where a lot of people tend to die or kill their model airplane is you're flying away, you're doing fine, you're climbing up and you know, you're going to be left or right, better right. But then when you do the turnaround that's typically when people will suffer a spiral of death because like with model cars you know, when you do the turnaround you've obviously got to mentally switch your left right according to the fact that the model is now flying at you and that's okay for most people until something goes up with the plane maybe you get a gust of wind or maybe you're trying to avoid something and then you go into panic mode and you start going in the wrong direction once you start going in the wrong direction that's it you go into the spiral of death because you actually start pushing harder in the wrong direction to try and get out of the uh, fault that you're in so if you actually get into those scenarios just take your hands off the sticks and if you have something like an old timer model or a trainer it should theoretically right itself and keep flying and give you a chance to get back on get your brain un, uh, untwisted and keep flying. But I mean, they're so cheap these days and everything, yeah, it's like 150 bucks and you've got a fantastic model aircraft that's dead easy to fly. Uh, when I started model aircraft, probably maybe 40 years ago now, it was very expensive process. Uh, and it really hasn't been until the last 15 years that things have become really cheap. You can either repair quickly and cheaply or replace entirely. So, there. Yeah. Personally, I like gliders, powered gliders or old timer. I don't really like the look of the old timer planes so much, but they do have a inherent stability factor, which makes them really good. I still like balsa wood type planes. Uh, all my designs are balsa wood planes. Foam is very popular these days, but I do find that repairing foam is a, yeah, it's, it's not my thing. It never really feels quite the same. The model's always really floppy, and there are ways that they improve on that. They'll like skin the foam with um, fiberglass or bolster and things like that, but personally, I just prefer good old balsa wood aeroplane. Hey, Alice. Just Clev. Okay, what have we got? Right, next boring job we've got to do is reassembly of job 239. That I've just banged into the edge of the bench. Oh wow, that brightness is something serious. That's better. This is just me clearing out the old jobs. We do have a repair job for tonight. It is on the floor there. But I've got to clear these guys out first. So this is job 239, the old um, UV lighting up good there. Flight simulators definitely help you, 
certainly to help you get used to the whole turn back and control reversal thing. I don't think it really matters whether you go ailerons or rudder as your primary turn. Not these days anyway. I think more people tend to have a natural preference towards aileron and elevator combination. And you really just using the rudder then as a, um, just as a bit of a make the turn smoother type thing. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is the SSD damage one that we had, that we had uh, issues in the socket there. Looks like the ultrasonic clean has fixed that up nicely. But we'll, we'll know for sure when we plug it back in. The SSD itself has got a bit of damage on there, but we did clean that up. My package of NAS drives and such still hasn't arrived. I'm still saying that it's in the same place. I'm now in the panicking phase. And hilariously, the 1708 top decks that I was trying to order in, I finally see a message today in my AliExpress saying, can we upgrade you to a different uh, delivery system? And that was like from two months ago when I ordered it. And I did not see that message at all until today. So it's actually been sitting in the warehouse waiting to dispatch. And yeah, I said some choice words after that. And Nick Nacy, teach your wife to reassemble these machines. No, she's busy with other things. She's busy socializing kitty cats and making me delicious sandwiches when I've been a good husband not on demand they certainly spend time with the flight simulator it does help it really does help with the turnaround and the orientation personally I found the hardest thing with a lot of model aircraft was just simply not being able to see the damn things beyond a certain distance. My favourite kind of model aircraft in general is a thing we call discus launch glider which uh, it's a glider but it's usually about 1.2 or 1.5 meter wingspan and you launch it by holding it by the tip of the wing and then you do a um, like a hammer throw, you know, in the Olympics, kind of. Uh, use one hand, fingertip of the wing between, you know, your fingertips there, with a, it's got a peg that you hold on to. You swirl, you twirl around, you launch it, you get about 120 to 200 foot launch, and then you try to catch yourself a thermal before your 30 to 60 seconds is up and you inevitably come back down. It's a good sport. It's a challenge because every time when you launch, you don't know whether you're going to catch a thermal or not. I generally find other types of model aircraft flying to be a little bit boring. It's like, yep, great, it's flying around, it's doing what I'm asking it, fantastic. Other people prefer things like acrobatics, other people prefer pylon racing. The only trouble I have with pylon racing is that you need a group of people to really make it extra fun. The upside of pylon racing is that when things do go wrong, it is quite a quite a show. Okay, why is this not? Ah, that's why. Pylon racing is, in a way, more of an engineering race. It's a case of trying to build this plane that will go very fast, a very low um, 
coefficient of um, friction, all those sort of things, but also very strong so that when you pull around the turn and do some impressively insane level of G's, your plane doesn't just disintegrate around the corner. But like I said, it is quite spectacular when they do disintegrate. It's uh, very loud too. All that force has to go somewhere and often it just yeah makes a rather loud bang. The speeds are around about 300, 300 up. The next level up from that, in terms of insanity, is what we call um, dynamic soaring. And dynamic soaring is not like with a handsaw cutting up things. It's where you um, fly, you get onto a, a bit of a hill, a ridge, and the wind comes up the ridge and on the front side of the ridge where the wind is coming up you can do what we call normal slope soaring with the uh, gliders so you, you know, fly around in the upcoming draft and you, know, you just have fun doing that but if you go to the back side of the ridge where the wind is rolling back over you can do what we call dynamic soaring and you basically it's kind of like being on a swing where you kick your legs to gain more and more momentum so if you time things right on the back side of the ridge with the right plane, you get a boost every time you go around and your speed just keeps getting up and up and up and up and up. I don't know what the world uh, limit, uh, what the world record is on that at the moment, but it's something ludicrous. Uh, I'm going to have to check that now. It's in the, re in the range of 500 miles per hour. Let's see. Um, dynamic. Dynamic. Oh wow, soaring speed record, 505 miles per hour is currently the speed record, Gee, that is crazy. Let's even bring this up. You pr barely can see it, but it's there. Yeah, that's not sped up. <laughs> but it's just insane how fast they go. But it's it's a little bit repetitive, going round and round, but I suppose the challenge is, you know, manufacturing that plane to not blow up into a million pieces. Oh, where'd my chat go? Ah, oh, there it is. Ben Wilson, silicon carbide has lower switching losses than IGBT. Uh, also, silicon carbide MOSFETs have lower conduction losses at low power. Okay. Now, I haven't really looked into them much because you know, the last time I was doing designing, it was. IGBTs was being the big thing, and uh, yeah, I didn't see much in the way of silicon carbide. Certainly, it was never within the realm of the kind of work I was doing. Hey, Jimbo. Oh, sorry, folks. Just realised. Yeah, there we go. I can be a little bit slow sometimes. Hey Jim, how's it going? No, you didn't miss too much yet. We're just in the rebuilding of old jobs phase, you know, putting things back together, getting ready for me to send invoices off to people, draining people's money for supposedly professional repairs where I drop screwdrivers. That's the other reason why I really like having the wearer drivers now is if I drop things, it's not a catastrophe. Whereas with my old Beku drivers, they they were um, 
aluminium, but they're still pretty heavy. And if you dropped them, yeah, you often could damage things. Just be <laughs> uh, Ben, I will be thankful for that. Have you flown flight gear? No, I haven't. Um, it's I do remember flight gear getting started when I was pretty much just getting out of the market. The big simulator at that point was called Phoenix. And I don't know if they still have that around, but yeah. Just thinking, wonder if I can find... Let's see. Let's just see if I can find my old discus launch video. YouTube. Ooh, apparently I'm live. Hmm. DLG. Yeah, yeah. This is getting a, if you give you an idea how low quality um, old this is. This is low quality. Let's see, Paul. And I was very much younger at this point. There we go. This is me probably 18 years ago now. It's slow motion. This is a discus launch. And that was filmed with an old tape camera. Yeah, the hair is still much the same, just pulled back. Okay, enough of my own uh, reminiscing. Let's get on with the job. Anyway, so that, that's what's called a discus launch. You can find better examples these days in high definition, 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second on YouTube with great ease these days. And yeah, I think that was an old Sony 720 uh, 576 p DAT tape camera. It was a pretty good camera, but um, compared to what you do these days, yeah. These days it looks like a potato cam. I do wonder how the world is going to handle the next 20 or 30 years in terms of social media for the fact that you're going to have all these kids growing up with full high definition videos of them and high quality photos of them in their youth and things like that. And then as they get older, they're going to be looking at these perfect renderings of what they were like when they were younger and they had everything that they wanted, so to speak. And they're gonna, it's going to be like waking up every morning and seeing the difference between what you were and what you are now, at least with dodgy quality photos and stuff like that. You can kind of squint and sort of go, ah, oh, yeah, you know, it wasn't bad looking then or whatever. But now we're in the realm of people being able to see with a little too much clarity how they have diminished. And it's going to mess with a few people, I reckon. Hey Wade, how's the Nightmare 20? Um, the Nightmare 21, I have a feeling, is probably a destroyed CPU or internal SSD. 
because I have seen that there was liquid damage on the VRMs and things like that. So that's why I'm thinking it's not responding to the um, Apple configurator. The DFU mode will come up, but then I was talking to Pionov and he was telling me this, but then the SSD can't come to life and things like that. So it just sits there and it says, well, I don't know what to do. I can't talk to the SSD. And that's probably what's happening. Uh, the liquid damage that was on those, it, the photos were taken of it, but by the time it got here, it had already been washed off. But I was given the photos of it. I just simply had forgotten about those photos. And so I have a feeling, yeah, that uh, the CPU or the SSD is cactus, and that's why it doesn't want to come up. Jeez. Mr. Yep. Looks like someone needs to take a hike. What about the brightness issue from yesterday? I don't know about that. I've had it happen on a couple of machines, and I don't know what caused it. I don't know whether it's they require a slightly different version of macOS, or no, really just don't understand it. I haven't bothered to dig into it because it's never been it's never been on a machine that I had to give to a customer. I've only ever seen it on machines that I'm just diddling around with. Dorian Gray syndrome. Uh, is that a legit thing? Is that a legit thing? Because that would be a um, definite uh, legit term to use, I'd say. Early troll. Hey, Jim, yeah. All the retirement homes were full of people hanging out on VR doing fun stuff. Yeah, hopefully that will be the case. We get ourselves into the whole uh, Wally scenario where we're just blobs hovering around on our chairs, enjoying our lives, oblivious to our reality. Then you could pull the whole Matrix thing and say, what is reality? I had a 1466 today, went to the bath after a clean, needed no board repair, first one ever. Oh, right, okay, so you just had to give it a wash and it was good. Ah, oh, Keith, it's not a term, it really should be a term, Dorian Gray Syndrome. I think that you should mark that down somewhere, that you mention that in this stream, because I think that's a good term to use. Or at least I think it is. Okay, no battery. It would be nice if we could live our, our lives a bit like in uh, Inception. Dive down a few levels, live a few hundred lifetimes for lunch. <laughs> I do wonder about the whole concept of how, you know, the knowledge you gain, do you really retain it? Um, do you really become a wiser person? Most people just get old, not wise. I seem to be heading down that path. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 2% charging. Let's see if we can see that SSD. Macintosh uses shared. That's kind of weird. Old habits are hard to break. They are, and yes, they do actually become harder as you go. I still manage to stop myself eating ice cream. 
that was difficult. Someone smuggling tobacco leaves in Australia bought a TV program. Why do people even do that? Uh. Well, we're... we're no. Your computer restarted because of a problem. No, that's fine. Acceptance of things you can't change. Uh, what? Your computer is starting. Okay, looks like this has got an issue with the solid state drive. Yeah, it's uh, having a rough day. Naturally, of course, I put all these damn screws in it. I'd say the solid state drive is probably cactus. Something mangled it. I don't know whether. It would just be the data side of it that's messed up. But in all honesty, if I had a solid state drive that took corrosion damage like that, then I would be quite disinclined to actually trust it again. At least you can get the replacements now from Transcend, the Jet Drive 820s and things like that. They are available, so can be a little bit expensive, but if you love your 1466s and your 1502s or your 1398s, then yeah, you'll pay the money and get one. Travis, yeah, <laughs> should uh, yeah, do that. Yeah. Can't believe I put all the screws in. I should have known that was an omen for it to happen. Greg, yes, that is correct. The contact itself was a NC pin, but it could have been enough to bridge across to something else. So what I'm going to do is I will test with a known working drive of my own and see what we get. Let's see, test drive, high Sierra. Actually, I wonder if I've got one that's an MVME one. Pretty sure I... No, no. Sheesh. Alright. I don't seem to have a spare MVME one. We'll see how this goes. You can use an adapter with an NVMe drive, but they're still not perfect as far as I understand. Oh, do I have to switch this on? There's no bong there for some reason. Although I just didn't hear it. Half the joy of not having good hearing. I can miss such things. Alright, so that's working fine. This is off an AHCI drive though. But it is working. Kind of curious to see now whether this can be read in my iMac. Oh well, yeah, the mag safe's kind of whoops. That was not intentional that it was bent like that. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Okay, make sure that's not plugged in. I do have both USB and Thunderbolt versions of these adapters now. 
which is kind of handy. Sometimes you just find one needs the other. Uh, so you want one or the other. Okay. Just Let's see. It's almost like I need a camera up here now. Oh, there's nothing but junk in that system information. Two fifty gig drive, but it's got sixty five gig of available, so there's something going on there. But it looks like the file system's corrupt. Hmm, something in other volumes, unless that's a... Oh, great. It's probably a secure volume or something. Which means that data's pretty much gone. Yep, that's a goner. Yeah, well, not so much for that. Uh, we'll just pack this up. Hopefully, a current backup somewhere. Probably not, but hopefully. I'll put the. I'll put the drive in the package that I send down to him. Fortunately, this is going to a, another business business. I just heard a beep and I don't know why. Normally that beeps from the Hacko soldering station, but that's not showing anything. Weird. Yeah, things that go beep in the night. A modern day horror. He was just getting to the end of the final episode of his Netflix series and suddenly the router beeped and restarted. No! Because it doesn't really, really count with Netflix and Stan and things like that because you could just get straight back where you were when um, it comes back up. Not like the old TV days where if you lost your power during a storm or something like that as they were broadcasting the final episode of a series. Yeah, that was torture. Alright, so 239. And it's different to the scanner beep too. Hacko, the possession. Yeah, that actually sounds about right, too. It sounds like a legit name that you could use for such a movie. Uh, let's see. Client SSD showing large consumption of space, but data not visible. Machinery. Paired boots and from... So yeah, test SSD. Job note submitted. Great, that one's off off to its home for tomorrow. What do you SMC? Oh we've got an SMC issue one as well. It came in the other day but I couldn't diagnose it. It just it was behaving. But so I had to check back on that. I think it was on video too. I had to check back on that, and it turns out it's a bit of an intermittent issue, which means I'm just going to love that. 
Beat was heard on the stream, yeah. <laughs> See, Greg, you decide to axe the TV. Oh, the cable TV, right, yeah. Yeah, these days we're definitely at the point now where the internet supply TV is the win. Every now and then when I'm forced to go to the dentist or something like that, I see broadcast TV, free-to-air broadcast. Oh, my goodness. I am glad I do not watch that stuff. Okay, so we have a 1398 here. Computer very dusty, perhaps some of the chips cooked, no signs of life. Okay, so it's a dead one. We're going to go over the top. Let's bring up our code. Brightness has gone to hell. Let's see what we got. I do like the 1398s, they're a nice machine. So 260, 270, 4 watts of power, not really... It's a bit of an odd number, not something I'm accustomed to seeing. Let's try power up. Doesn't seem to be any response. We are getting MagSafe activity, so we probably do have 3v42 and SMC activity. Um, I'm not sure what to guess on this one. ISL 6259, but then again it did go into charging mode. Alright. Let's get the screws out of this. Clock fault. Hmm. Random corrosion. It could be daughter board on these, holding it down. Corroded daughter board. It's a fairly common occurrence. I'm not sure what year this one is, so we could also have a triple. If it's a triple three two, we do have the U eighty nine hundred issue to fix too. But that wouldn't tend to cause this behavior. Almost there, almost there. I think the battery's been replaced. And yeah, it's not really sitting in properly anyway. Not that it mattered. Get the SSD out. Hey, where'd my... It always seems like an overkill initially to be putting stickers on SSDs every time. But uh, a time when you get things wrong and you lose your SSD, you'll be very thankful you put a sticker on it. And this is a 426 board. Okay, we do not normally get those. Eight two zero double forty six. Nothing blatantly obvious, straight up.
Interesting. Normally that cable should go over the battery, shouldn't it? Not that, again, not that that should really matter. I think this is going to be a case of take the board out, see what we're dealing with. Is the water marker under the SSD red? No, that doesn't actually have one. It's a test point. Do not see many of these. There certainly seem to be a good number of iterations of the 1398. Change the style of that. They didn't change the fact that it's in a major pain in the butt to get that camera connector off there. It's a pain because you don't want to knock high cables too aggressively because you don't want them to dip, you know, pull out. Like you don't want this part to separate from the coax. It's just an awkward way they've done it. And you don't really have any slack on the camera cable either. So you can't really you know just lift it up like that. <laughs> Shut up. Leave that connected. Test, yes, test. Okay, two long screws go in the middle here. At least if they've kept consistent. Ah, oh, come on. Not really sure what I'm going to be facing under here. I um, can only hope there's going to be some corrosion around the bottom edge somewhere. Do not do that, that could have gone into the battery. Okay. I 
probably just some shorted MOSFETs. Oh yeah, oh, no trouble at all. Just because we had luck last night does not mean that is going to continue tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a little bit shell shocked over that bit of success. Trying to see if I've got a hidden flex somewhere holding this down or whether I've just got... Ah, yeah. This one here. And there is some dust, but we don't have any corrosion spotting on the bottom that I can see. Not to say there isn't corrosion, but you know, that's often a way that you can quickly see if there is anything amiss. Let's have a look under the microscope, shall we? Just take the heat pad away since it does tend to inhibit the free flowing of the board. Turn on the fume extractor and brush. I see now that they protect the GPU area with the underfill. It was a very common area for corrosion to get picked up. You see they've at least tried to prevent that. Interesting, no edge bonding on the SMC. Ruslan, yeah, camera is stuck, just noticed. Nice, the video how to clean a MacBook board pro Mac pro properly, probably, um, yeah, I don't know if there is such a thing, it's more a case of, depends on what you're dealing with. Ideally, you get away with just brushing the dust off. Oh my goodness. Looks like someone bringing out the old midnight oil. I actually went to one of their concerts. I also went to an In Excess concert back when it was Michael Hutchinson. Before he committed himself to a to the end. Okay, we've got a soldable there. That doesn't concern me. Ah, 
Um, I'm just using a paintbrush. Uh, yeah, just a soft head. Well, not even soft head. Regular household. What is that? A half inch paintbrush. Sometimes I use a two inch paintbrush. That's an interesting style of routing that they've got going there for the traces. Obviously to keep the timings right. Yeah, you see these balls are popping up everywhere, but that's manufacturing. That's not... Um, it's not f due to a fault or anything like that. Three V forty two circuit looks okay. Uh, input resistors don't look burned. This is going to be a fun one. If I'm not careful, if it doesn't deliver something to me soon, this is going to be a rabbit hole. If I'm not careful, not sure I want a rabbit hole. Yeah, rabbit holing. Solder balls, of course, happen. These do have the VRMs in them, but I don't know if the VRM will be quite at fault again. It could still have been the daughter board, so I guess what we should do is plug in. I should have done the daughter board test originally. Oh, where have I put the chipmunk? Oh, there it is. Hi, <laughs> Michael Chan. So we had a momentary power up there. That means we've probably got a short somewhere. Okay, let's watch the current when we connect and see what happens. No, maybe not. Yeah, it just seems to go to 260. Alright, let's bring out the infrared camera because we're lazy. And we live in eternal hope that the infrared camera will answer all our questions. Because we're lazy. Yeah, flare time. I have a feeling it's possibly not going to really give us anything but we'll have a look yeah very much a please bro sort of way out of it I agree first thing I could do is actually get it to synchronize with it Oh, Wayne's here. Oh, good. I'm sure he's dying for everybody to say hello individually. See if anything pops. We'll just adjust the alignments here. That should about do it. Are you really that, or are you just lying to me? Okay, the heat spread dissipation makes me think it's telling the truth. Yeah, let's have a look again. Alright, yeah, that's our part that it's saying is dodgy. Okay, I'll put my finger on that and see if it gets warm. 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's warm. Yeah, okay, that's that's warm. Which is not good because that's actually a MOSFET, I think. But it's not so much that that will be faulty, but rather it's going to be an indication of what something is faulty. Let's see. I'm going to bring up flexboard view. Because I do not even know what that part does. Something with the input, no doubt. Okay, so that's up here. And I'm trying to think it's this one here, I think that was cooking up. 7130. Oh dear. Okay, that's to our PP bus G3 hot. So does that mean we've got a short on our PP bus? Let's see what our big coil says. Give me a little distance here, please. Yeah, point four ohms on our PP bus. Let's do the overhead. So from there to ground. Point three. That that's a pretty hard short. Okay, so what we might be looking for here is a cap or something like that. That's decided to have a bad day. We'll go back to the infrared and see if we can see anything else lighting up. Use this technique on the iPhones a fair bit, so I don't have to bother with changing out that uh, VCC bat versus main cap uh, MOSFET rather okay so I'm just making sure that yeah, it's pretty cool how it tracks that Flip it over, see if there's anything on the other side that might be feeling a little cosy. Okay, what do we got? Okay, I think that's an ISL. So you're getting hot. Anything else? Well, I'm going to guess that's an ISL 9625 or whatever it is. Overhead. Six two five nine. Yep. Now the question is, uh, is it getting hot because it's faulty or is it getting hot because something down the road is causing the issue? Now, if we have a look at the schematic again, not that one, we could see we could take out the L7130 and we'd be able to find out, ah, you know what, we'll just take the fuses out and see which side it's resting on. It's probably going to be on the system side, of course. So we short like this is probably going to be, well, let's hope it's a cap. 
<clears throat> Pardon me. Where the hell's my chat gone? Lost my chat window. Please stand by. Not there. Ah. Wasn't expecting it there. Hey Jason, just saw you there. Uh, more thirty ninety eights. Always fun. Seemed dodgy with trust in the infrared. <laughs> Everything's dodgy when you start trusting infrared. Anyway, we'll take those two fuses off. Wherever the hell they are. 7140. Uh, just above the ram deck. Right, yeah, there they are there. We'll get them off. And then we'll see which side the short is. We probably actually, if I had a four-wire system, we could probably work it out. But I actually might try this. Hang on there. Let's see. We're going to go two wire model, low speed, range. We're going to go the 500 ohm range and see what happens. Inject voltage into PP. Yeah, I want to see which side it goes on. Okay. Let's see what this stabilizes at. So point four or something. Not too close to tell. No. A four wire resistance test we would have been able to just extract the resistance from the uh of the fuses and then see which side was actually the lower resistance. Anyway. Anything I don't like here is that the RAM's right there. I'm just going to pickle these so they come up a little bit quicker. Hey, Covey Seawolf. Uh, we just got a 1398 that won't turn on and appears to have a nice size short somewhere on the PP bus. And so we're basically embarking on taking perhaps most likely the wrong route towards finding out where on the PP bus this short is. But doing things incorrectly is everything that we're doing normally anyway. I do find it interesting that they've gone for the two fuse technique here. I don't know why. I'm not sure what the justification is I can only imagine that they wanted to have a really compact solution for something but I don't know I really don't know why they've done it but I am curious so that oh what damn it that was holding up very well and then all of a sudden it decided to not hold up so well. That's unfortunate. I really should have taken that off originally. My bad. Okay, let's check the resistance here. Ah, this is unusual. So what have we got? 1.2, and then we'll check the resistance on this side. For once, it's actually on the ISL side, and not on the system side. That, I will consider to be a, a lucky star thing. That kind of really does 
cut down. Is that cut down on the possibilities. I'm just seeing if we could see anything visually. Like a cracked cap or something like that. Before I go injecting more voltage in, that is. A lot of corrosion around that larger one. Uh, might have just been a artifact. Not seeing any real corrosion around here. It's, um, wait, what are you looking at? C7133. Now, I think you might actually be right, good sir. I think, no, nah, damn, it's a hair. That actually looked pretty damn convincing, if you ask me. Sorry, I'm just going through the schematic and having a look at things. There's really not a lot that it could possibly be. C7140. Oh, it, that thing really did look like a look like a crack. Yeah. Uh, I think in this case maybe let's take the ISL off and see if the behavior changes. It's a like I said, it's a little odd that that was getting warm, but it could have just been a case of it was trying to drive a. Is that a hole in the resistor? No, it's just a piece of junk. It could also be that whatever it is that is shorted is of sufficiently high, uh, sufficiently good short that we can't really see what's going on. Little cap at the bottom, are you talking about this brown one? Yeah, I know you guys are making me want to inject voltage, but I'm trying really hard not to be such a such a brute. Better hope it is a component and not the board, but then if it was the board, it would probably show up. See, we've got pyrotechnic fanatics here. Let's see what it does now when I plug the power in. Still just pops up, 
gets dragged down. Alright, ISL's coming off. The other thing to remember is that the infrared camera gives a relative, it uses relative temperatures, so even though it looks like it's a big bloom, it's not really super hot, it's just getting warmish. I mean, okay, it felt a little hot on my hand, but it's not like it's catch on fire temperature or anything like that. But it just looks like that because relative to the cooler board around it, it's not a high temperature. So I'd say ISL is our highest likelihood of a candidate. Especially that it was getting warm. Though it doesn't explain why the MOSFET was getting hot. Unless what was happening is the ISL couldn't switch properly. And it just kept that ISL permanently on. Which, if it was really doing that, nah, anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. See what our resistance is now. That's the other thing is, I'm not sure how the ISL would play into making. Anyway, I'm going to stop guessing so much and start probing. That's that's a dead set short still. So we can't blame the ISL. Now if we go look at the schematic, yeah, so what's happening is we've got a dead short showing up here, we've taken the um, ISL away, so we could be shorting through this MOSFET, or we could be shorting through any of this gear here. Um, we very unlikely to be going for Q7155. Pardon me. So it could be anything, really. Alright, well, I guess we'll inject some power, eh? Let's put some power in and see what happens. Do you want that 2016 recovery tool? Um, maybe just actually have it on standby, just in case someone in the Australian community needs one, and then... You could just hire that thing out and get some money back for it, I guess. I mean, it's worth hiring out. But it's... Yeah, it was going to be the great tool, but then... Apple kind of double-backed on us and said, Haha, just kidding. Made all you idiots buy something that you didn't need. It's not really the best place to put this cable, but it's the most convenient based on where my hands are right now. <laughs> Have you tried using glass cloth thermal spray mouse and tape to protect PCB components from melting? I haven't, no. I know the stuff you're talking about. Kind of tempting to put it in there, but that's actually a pretty awkward angle to get in. Yeah, okay. Guess we're putting our ground in there. I could use a clip, but clips tend to be a little bit. Clips have a bad tendency of letting go just as when you need them not to. Oh, come on. Okay, 
That's good. No cam. Bad habit of not getting the cam right. Okay, we've also got to take off 18 volts. We don't want that. We're going to set the voltage down to... 2 volts is going to be more than enough. In fact, 1 volt. 5 amps. They'll give us 5 watts. And if we can't find it with 5 watts of heat, then we'll consider increasing it. But 5 watts of heat should be plenty. I guess we should get the Infraredo Camerono back up here. Let's see what lights up. If anything, for that matter. Yeah, we're not going to do 18 volts into that. That would just be a little bit ridiculous. Because it is such a short and there's no current protection, we could end up putting 60 watts straight into the board and that will be the end of the board. And I would be very sad. alcohol and touch but people want to see the infrared that's the thing people like the toy So here we go, 1 volt, 5 amp, confirmed. Hit the ONOFF button. And bam, right between... That's the MOSFET again. Either that or it's a teeny tiny cap in there. Let's see, we just get our alignments back up. Try it again. And now yeah, it's a MOSFET again. Hmm. We got bad MOSFET. Q7135 are you? Okay, now yeah, maybe the MOSFETs decided to drop dead. I'm just going to do an alcohol confirmation of this to make sure I am looking at the right part. It's definitely this part here, right next to the second coil. Yeah, which is Q3175. It must be shorter because of the ISL not there. That gate should actually be just open. Um, not, not open, it should be not functioning. So the fact that it's shorting means it's basically given up, so we'll have to get a replacement for that. And that will probably be the cause. At least I hope so. Let's see, overhead. Yeah, on the low side. So it was this one here again, which is the one that originally I think came up. I think I got thrown thinking it was this one, but I think it was this one that was actually at fault. 
when I originally looked at it. Okay, so we need to get that off. And the only real part here of concern is going to be that connector there, so we'll just give that a little bit of a shielding. Not much. Okay. Um, there are certain parts on the board that will tend to show up as if they are hot spots, but they're not. That's just because of the radius, the reflectivity. And that's why I like that I can just sort of adjust the alignment on the image. And so usually you just find whatever's showing up bright when it's off and make the alignment so the pattern fits. Yeah. Well, it looks like last night's little project with the CPU MOSFETs turned out to be practice for today. Emissivity, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a little short of... Couldn't use my proper words then. Thank you, Jim. Okay, we're just pickling the pads a little bit. It's not really going to do much, but yeah, they're not going to take. It's fine. So here we go. I'll just turn that slightly so I get a better angle on it. Very unlikely that that connector will get damaged, but either way, I don't want to have to replace it. In a lot of these cases, when you're trying to remove these sort of parts, Getting the board warm is more important than the part. If you sit there and just focus on the part, chances are you're going to end up cooking things around it and not even succeeding in getting it off half the time. I'm using a lower air than what I would normally do with MacBooks. Uh, normally I run around at 110 litres per minute, but for this sort of stuff I seem to find 80 is my preference. There we go. Well, I guess we should be thankful it wasn't welded to the board, which can often happen. Yeah, let's check our resistance now. The ground and the coil. I think we're good because it's showing overload. Auto. It's telling me infinite now. That actually makes sense. Yeah, that actually makes sense because we've disconnected the coil from the circuit, so that's good. Hey, Steve K. Right, so we better get ourselves a replacement, one of those. Not too sure if they share common MOSFETs between them because this is a newer model by quite a quite a few years I've got plenty of 3000 series ones I guess the easiest way to find is we just search search for it 
search for it. Schumatak. We are looking for the Anthem FFS for Sheetan M. Okay, let's go look for that. Search, find a part. Paste. Search. I'm pretty sure I got a 163. Realistically, you could probably get away with a few other substitutions. Yeah, I don't think the iPhones are going to have any. Oh. Guess who's got a 426 board? <laughs> I didn't know I had a 426. How was I supposed to know that? Gee. This first board I pulled out after I yanked the whole tray out. My bad. Alright, so they are, in fact, uh, the 138, the 163, and the 426 are the only ones that have it. Interesting to note. So we have 426, and there we have our... And these are a matched pair probably, so you got the 4C10N, 4C06N, they're probably a deliberate, um, what do you call it, uh, switch mode power pair. Hey, Richard Moore. Mm. I'm kind of curious as to why it actually died like that. Yeah, you don't normally expect MOSFETs to just drop dead like that in this sort of scenario. So it does play on your mind a little bit like, what caused you to die? Was it bad luck? And I mean, if it was bad luck, so be it. You know, it was just bad luck. But you still can't help but wonder, is there another issue at hand somewhere? The unfortunate thing is you can't really find out. I was going to say, it's just starting to let go. Yeah, Warren, I did. There's no short. <laughs> it was open circuit after I took it off, which is correct because I've taken the fuses away. Jimba, I'd say the um, 06 might be engineered for a different kind of gate drive or have a different kind of gate properties compared to the 10. I don't put too much solder on that one. Yep, it says Paul and then who puts too much solder on it. Ach, niemand. Nee. Nee. Come on, come to freedom. <laughs> uh, that's more than ample solder for the task there. Yeah, 
If I'd cut off a piece of wick, that probably wouldn't have happened. But wick in itself, of course, is an excellent conductor of heat because it's, you know, a good fat strip of pure copper, or pretty close to pure copper. So it's naturally going to drain the heat away from where you want it. Let's try to get this area a little bit warmed up before I drop the chip in. The flux should hold good. Down it goes. Like Leonardo DiCaprio to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, uh, Jim, maybe have a look at the um, total gate charge requirements or the maybe the VGS threshold. I don't know. But yeah, there normally would be some sort of difference. Otherwise, they would normally use you know, two of the same. That is not the right kind of fuse that you want there, where that's an actual bridge of solder. That's asking for trouble. Okay, we're going to double check our resistance again. Okay, so we're showing uh, 30 odd K, so 40 K, so that's, that's pretty good. We're back to normal now. Sorry, what's this, Miguel, about my software programming? Now I've got to see what Miguel's talking about. Um, yeah, Miguel, the part find function is part of the flex board view, yeah. It's one of those things that I've found myself constantly needing to do, so I thought I would implement it into the software. Oh, we've got to put our ISL back on now. Whose fault is it for me ripping that off? To be honest, oh wow, that came out loud. Uh, to be honest, I'm probably going to use a different ISL and not the one that I took off the board just in case it has an issue with it. Charge gate difference is only one nano coulomb. Yeah, it's definitely not enough, is it? Yeah, the mystery of why they use the different MOSFETs. The only other thought is maybe the turn on time, but then these days the uh, controllers here yeah, they have the the uh, safety window for the timing, so I'm not sure what to think about that because I know in the old well not in the old days but I know a common thing that can happen when you do switch mode supplies like that is people don't put in the window between the turn off of one side and the turn on of the other and then all of a sudden you get yourself a rather spectacular short circuit from your rails to ground and people wonder why everything goes to hell. It's a shame that I'm going to have to put this one on but I am going to put this one on.
Oh, that's right, we're only at 80F, so that'll explain why this is taking forever. Here it comes. Jimbo, checking the Seuss Thunderbolt 3TI yesterday. It's two voltage regulators on it for the USB-C power system. One regulator uses four, four CO6 is the other four. Yeah. All right. Interesting that they're showing up both um, on that and on this Apple machine. Especially considering the age of this. It's ever so slightly crooked. I probably made it worse. Focus is slightly off too. That's better. Good, let's see how we go, whether we're going to get fireworks or not. Let's get back to our 18 volts. Okay, let's see, what's this to the left? What? What was Barry saying? Part listings. Oh, right, that's okay. How old is that board? Um, good question. Probably 2015 or so. A bit old, a bit newer than that. Not sure when the 426 came out. Anyway, let's uh, see if we have a pop bang or whether we have success. No, same thing, just dropped out then. Different amperage though. Okay, that's no good. Oh, you know why? We didn't connect the damn fuses. Whose fault's that? Is it yours? Is it yours? I think it was your fault. No one bothered to say, hey Paul, the fuses could do to be reconnected. And that's a double jointed fuse. Yeah, that's really shonky. <laughs> it's also out of focus. I'm actually going to clean that up. I'm not going to leave that like that. It's one of the few times that I'll use Wick to do this.
There we go. Well, I suppose we should be thankful that we got such a low current reading when we were expecting something higher because of the fact that the fuses weren't running. Just doing turbo cooling. So we've got some Gordon Ramsay quotes coming in. Yeah, let's try that again. Hopefully we'll have a little more success this time. Just a little more success. Okay, we do get full power up. Oh wow, that is a cranky fan. <laughs> Well, that reminds me of my. It reminds me as a kid when you used to put a playing card on your forks of your push bike to pretend that you actually have a motor in your push bike because it would wear you out very quickly. But uh, hey, it sounded cool. That's all that mattered. But yeah, cranky fan. It could be just dust in it. First I've got to dislodge this fan. You can't really yank on these ones. Because of the cable design, yanking on it just immediately tears them. That's oh, really lodged in there. Now oh, there we go. Wow, some good quality bearings going on in there. Let's crack open the fan and see what we can do. We'll take these screws out and sometimes you can get lucky. But look, I'll be realistic here and say that in this sort of scenario, you just replace the fan. But I'm kind of curious to see what is making it rattle. Kind of sounds like trash in the bearings. Though these usually use just sleeves. Not very often they have ball bearings in them. Okay, so is this just a pressed sleeve? Yeah, it's, it's beautifully spot welded in there and pressed on that side. Let's see if it still makes a noise. Yep. That's that's a goner of a fan. Yeah. Can't do much about these. Once they're pressed in, that's it. it's the end of the day. Oh well. New fan for the person. Oh, it's cleared up now. We're all good. I wonder if it was a piece of junk under there. But you know it's going to come back. It sounds fine now, but you know, if you pack that up with this fan and you send it back, it's going to start that trash again, just as the customer gets it. It's inevitable. The worst thing is you can't even ultrasonic these. It'd be nice if you could just throw it in the ultrasonic cleaner and you know to clear out the trash but when you ultrasonic them it tends to i can't say that word it, it ruins the bearing assemblies yeah default replacement you just charge yeah 
But I might just keep it for my own sake. Probably should do both, to be honest. Could that have been drawing too much volts? No. Unfortunately, nowhere near likely. And this is on the 5 ESO line, so... Not gonna happen. The traces would burn up before anything else. CTPC Cranky A139 Whoops 8 Right hand fan Yeah RHF And that way I know I'm never going to Put that back into a customer machine And yeah the left hand one if the right hand one's done it, the left hand one's going to probably do it as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you could clear it with some air bursts and stuff like that. But I think, like I said, for the cost of what the fans do cost, I mean, yeah, it's not a trivial amount of money, but it's not worth the risk of sending it back to a customer. And two weeks later it starts making the horrible noises. Yeah, that's the sort of stuff that gives you bounced jobs, gives you a bad reputation, and gives you, you know, slots getting used up and wasting your time. So I'd much rather, push come to shove, I'd much rather myself pay the money to get these new fans at no cost to the customer than send it back with these fans. It's that's how much I feel about it. But I will just put them into my collection for the sake of having random fans. Fanning the winds of discontent, yes, we'd rather buy the be. It's just asking for Murphy's Law to kick in full force. So how are we going tonight? Half past eleven, I think it's good. We probably can finish up. What I will do is, just to keep you happy, I'll put it back into the chassis and at least make sure it does boot. Yeah, Sonia, I wouldn't even call it professionalism, I'd just call it risk management or reduction of exposure management sort of thing. It's bad enough dealing with the faults that you can't predict, let alone leaving yourself at risk of the faults that probably could have been avoided. I guess that's what it comes down to. Was that your son was left-handed? And teacher forced him to go right. Oh man, that's that's no good. What was he born in the 1850s or something? But I suppose they were still doing the whole left-handed, anti-left-handed thing as far as probably the 50s, 1950s, I imagine. I was lucky, certainly by the late 70s. They were not doing that, it's certainly not at my school they weren't. So I was free to be a left-handed person. <sighs> Although they did not have left-handed desks. Which was a bit of a pain, so you did tend to write with a bit of a quirky nature. But that's okay. These days we have the internet and the computers and it doesn't matter.
Now that, I'm f almost certain that cable is supposed to be above the battery. I'm more of an ambidextrous person. There's a lot of things I'll do right-handed. Playing golf for one, batting in cricket. I will bowl left-handed, I'll play squash left-handed. Occasionally I'll play squash right-handed, just for a bit of a fun thing. If I feel like um, I've been paired up with someone who I shouldn't have been paired up with in the sense of unfairly for them, then I will tend to play right-handed just to you know, give them a chance to have a good shot and gives me a challenge to practice with you know, sometimes when you're playing squash or you know any game where you've got to have two players sometimes you can end up with a mismatch of skill levels just simply because there's not enough people around oh you mongrel knew you'd get caught under there I was watching you and I there we go Wonder how many computers go around with those flexes trapped away. No, I'm not permanently fitting these. It's just purely so that we can do a test. Nah, leave that one out. <laughs> Put this one in. Not having my glasses is actually starting to be a nuisance here. Secure the fan in. Boot stick in. Connect the battery up. Connect some power. Turn on. We'll just sound like a bong. Yeah, unfortunately, Warren, I do remember clearly them being downstairs before I came up here, and then I got distracted and came up without them. Ooh, my wife's checking on me. Hey sweetie, I'm all good, I'm almost finished. I'm just checking to make sure our computer gets started and then I'm closing up and coming downstairs. Love you, bye. All right, let's see, one, two, three, four. Oh, is the leader in here? Ah, pfft, gee, just, just sent you a message, leader. Okay, Wi-Fi's working. That's working. Camera won't work at this point because I have switched that off. Need an intercom. That's what a phone's for. And we're doing 52 or so frames per second on valleys. So that's pretty good. Oh. 
That works. Brightness works. Let's check see if the audio works. I'm pretty sure I plugged in, yeah, the microphone's working. Uh, so this is all looking good. So definitely fixed. So there we go, in the end it was the low side MOSFET of the input stage from the battery, DC in. Not very often I encounter that particular fault, uh, not the DC input of the um, ISL PP just, PP bus G3 hot generation. So yeah, don't normally see that on these sort of things, but hey, it's always good to have something different. I'm sure there are other people out there who do see it quite a lot. It can be funny at times how what you experience can be very different to what other workshops experience. Like for the longest time, I would never have any real failures with uh, 1534s. And everyone else was saying, yeah, the 1534s were dying left, right and centre. And mine were just doing fine. Uh, eventually that did actually catch up with me. And now any 1534 that comes into here, I immediately give it its last rights. Tell the customer that's what to expect. And um, prepare them to buy a new machine. And hopefully I can get the data off it. Because often they are always... Um, won't boot, stop booting, or graphic issues showing up. Okay, so that's that. Okay, we're done. So, thank you very much. I'll see you guys next time, whenever that may be. Might be tomorrow. Who can tell? Depends what turns up in the mail. Till then, you all take care. I'll catch you later.